It's like the the uh, nematodes parasite that gets inside the the Japanese beetles. So I have less Japanese beetles. Sorry, my farmer's coming out of me. Wow, your farmer is coming out. <laughs> <laughs> He's channeling his inner farm. <laughs> Meet the Pressers with Matt Mallory and Clint Necro. Brought to you by Public Safety and Education and the Trigger Pressers Union. And now, your hosts. Welcome, everyone, to Meet the Pressers. My name is Clint Macro, and this is my esteemed colleague, Matthew Mallory. Meet the Pressers is a safe place for trigger pressers, gun enthusiasts, liberty minded individuals to talk about training, safety, guns, gear, politics, political activism, and religion sometimes. So we have a very interesting special guest here today. Matt, would you do the honor of introducing this man? You betcha. Justin Danhoff, corporate warrior for over a decade, helping to uh, beat the uh, anti-gunners from a different angle. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing more about how you do that and how we can help. This episode is brought to you by Mountain Man Medical. The right medical training and gear should be accessible to every American. Mantis. Mantis X helps shooters suck less. Meet the Pressers is sponsored by Next Level Training, Saber Red, Cutting Edge Bullets, the USCCA, ASP, Common Sense Self-Defense, and T1 Ammunition. Meet the Pressers is also generously supported by other fine companies, ranges, and our Patreon members. Thank you. In law school, it's fair to say I stuck out like a sore thumb. <laughs> law school is a, a bastion of liberalism, um, and I wanted to I wanted to actually make a difference. And I, you know, I had gone I had done finance and economics in my undergrad, and I saw what was happening in business. And I, I kind of wanted to do something about it. I had actually worked at the SEC, uh, which is a, a big player in all of this. They regulate how shareholder activism works. So I had a, had a sense of how to do it. Um, and I had a sense of the problem. And we were very early on, and, and, you know, at the beginning, you know, when we we're doing this about a decade ago, even some in our own movement were like, hey, why are you going after business? Business is, you know, American business is the greatest system ever created. And, Mm. While that is true, that system was created, I just started going down the list of traditional liberties that were being offended. They're you know, when you talk about the social media companies limiting your speech, yeah. I mean, they're not the government, but they're limiting speech. Mm -hmm. um, we go to the Second Amendment next. Then we go to religious freedom, uh, issues of life. Like how, how many more sensibilities can they offend before we should say something? Definitely. So give us a little background on how, uh, how your organization, the name of the organization, how it started and, and uh, you know, what your goal is, what your focus is. Sure. So the, I direct a free enterprise project at a larger group called the National Center for Public Policy Research. Uh, it's a Washington, D.C. based think tank that was founded in 1982. Uh, the, the founder uh, passed away a couple of years ago. Her name was Amy Reidenauer. And she started the group with a really great mission. And that mission was wherever the conservative movement was the quietest, we would fill in that voice. And we also wanted to stay nimble so we could be more of an activist organization rather than just writing white papers. And so that's where we started the Free Enterprise Project a little more than a decade ago. We took, out a, we took a look at the corporate landscape and we were kind of scratching our heads saying, why are so many large American publicly traded companies taking leftist position after leftist position on energy issues, healthcare issues, religious freedom issues, life issues, and the Second Amendment. We said, what's going on here? And we realized there was a whole slew of liberal activist organizations that were engaged in shareholder activism. They were buying up stock in these companies so that they had a voice in the room to pressure them on whatever their pet issue was. And this started um, under a moniker of, you know, corporate social responsibility, right? Social investing. And it now falls under the banner of ESG. That is environment, social, and governance. And the left is very good at branding what they're engaged in, right? Because 
who's against the environment? Who's against good social causes? And who's against good governance? Well, no, the kids. <laughs> <laughs> but what that again, what that really means is whatever a liberal interest group wants on that given day. And they were using these these shareholder, these investor tools. And we saw that no one on the conservative side was doing this. So we just started the free enterprise project. And I've got to tell you, Matt, it's a lot of fun. I engage with some of the, the biggest CEOs in the United States of America, and we have a lot of impact and we have a lot of influence. But right now, the way that the, 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 the stage is set is essentially we've got the free enterprise project on the right, and we still have anywhere between 80 and 100 groups on the left that do what I do. Wow. So the deck is still stacked. And I'm not talking about some small groups. When we're talking about the liberals that engage in shareholder activism, we're talking about CalPERS, the California State Retirement System for public employees. They have over $300 billion in assets under management. That's a lot of influence. Yeah. And they use it. The New York State uh, Public Retirement Fund. And then actual asset managers that push these issues as well. BlackRock, they're the largest asset manager in the world. Their CEO, Larry Fink, is a far left activist individual who uses his seven trillion in assets under management to push other companies around to take left-leaning positions that comport with his worldview. So the deck is really stacked against, you know, those who believe in traditional values, those who believe in religious freedom, freedom of speech, uh, the Second Amendment, and and the list goes on and on. Well, I, I can tell you, I know myself, my company is called Trigger Pressers Union. And I have been blacklisted by multiple providers, including Yahoo and Comcast, because, well, I mean, Trigger Pressers Union, all you got to do is think, think about firearms and look me up and you can see what, what my deal is. I know uh, our, our primary Second Amendment organization here in Pennsylvania called Firearms Owners Against Crime, I happen to be the, the uh, second vice president. And we have been battling this left and right with email providers. And I know Matt has had dealings with banking institutions. I know a lot of the instructors that he and I have trained, you know, for instance, like having trouble collecting money through services like PayPal or, or Square or Stripe or some of the other uh, merchant types of uh, organizations or companies rather. So yeah, this, this corporate censorship I think is, is a way you can put it. It's definitely something that a lot of us in the training industry have found. And, and after all, we're training people to exercise an, a constitutional right and do it in a safe and prudent manner. Right. But yet we are still being censored from time to time. Yeah. And so what I like to, you know, let folks know is if they open up the Wall Street Journal and see um, that Citigroup is no longer going to lend to certain gun manufacturers, that didn't happen because the CEO woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Okay. It was a years long campaign of pressure from outside activist groups that I'm talking about, but also other corporations pressuring uh, within industries. So it's, it doesn't just happen because the CEO woke up on the wrong side of the bed. The left is really engaged in these battles and they come back year after year after year to in intimidate the, these corporations into taking these actions. You know, again, they file resolutions, they show up in droves at shareholder meetings, they protest. And what is it about? Why do they want you debanked? Because it's about silencing you, right? It's about speech. And the left knows something very well that the conservative movement better wake up and realize. And that's this simple statement. You don't need to change a law to change the culture, mm. right? The left would like to abolish the Second Amendment, or at least many on the left right? They're not going to get that done in the courts. Legislatively, under the Obama administration, they, they couldn't get it done, right? right? They, they know that they can't change the law. So they're trying to change your ability to engage with that constitutional right. Uh, a gun owner will spend a lot of money on having 10, 15, 20, 30 guns in their house, but try to get them to donate some money to a group that's actively working to uh, further liberty, and that's a hard thing to do. You know, the money, the money does talk. And unfortunately, a lot of these anti-liberty organizations and groups are very, very, very well funded. And that's kind of what you alluded to before. 
Oh, and, you know, let's talk about how they get some of their funding. Like Mayor, Mayor Bloomberg's gun grabbing group, right? Former Mayor Bloomberg. Um, they got upwards of a million dollars from the Levi's Corporation, who makes jeans. Yeah. Okay. So what did we do with that information? So this is kind of how we operate. We, we conducted a poll, or we commissioned a poll, I should say. We didn't, we didn't do the polling ourselves. So we commissioned a poll on that. And we found that, you know, once we informed the American public, what Levi's was doing, who they were in bed with, what they were funding, there was, you know, the potential for hundreds of millions in losses because people would not buy the brand anymore. Mm -hmm. So we took that poll to the shareholder meeting and confronted the CEO with it. Guess what he said? I don't care. I'll happily lose money. This is a publicly traded company and the CEO admits he's doing his investors a disservice but it's to advance a social cause that he believes in in his heart. My goodness, what a dereliction of duty on this behalf of that CEO. But sometimes we have some more positive results. Let me give you, let me give you, a, you know, a happy note. Please. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, Bank of America after the, the, the shooting in Parkland was one of the companies that jumped on, you know, the, the anti-Second Amendment bandwagon pretty quickly. Okay, um, they said they weren't going to lend to certain gun manufacturers and everyone knew what that meant. Um, so I went to the shareholder meeting armed with just some simple questions. I had happened to be watching CNBC a week before the meeting and they were interviewing Berkshire Hathaway CEO Warren Buffett. And they were asking him about all these companies taking anti Second Amendment positions, you know, hashtag boycott NRA and, and, and the like. And he said, even though Warren's quite a, quite a lefty himself, said, I think that these decisions are ridiculous. I wouldn't place my personal politics on the heads of all of my investors and my employees. That, that, that would be ridiculous. It's not the purpose of business. So I went to the Bank of America's uh, shareholder meeting and I asked the CEO, Brian Moynihan, two questions. I said, first, can you tell us how much money we're going to lose as investors? We're all here as investors. You're, you're canceling your own clients. How much money is that going to cost us? Yep. And then second, who has it right? You or Warren Buffett? <laughs> Smart man. Well, you three, is not Warren. He gave some political grandstanding answer um, that, that didn't really, you know, say anything. But three weeks later, they made a major loan to Remington, <laughs> which was one of the banned companies. Now, do you know who the largest shareholder is in Bank of America? Remington. Berkshire Hathaway. Really? So while he gave me a grandstanding answer, his entire board of directors was sitting in the front row. My guess is after the meeting, some of the board said, hey, why are we doing something that Warren Buffett says is stupid? Right. Mm -hmm. Right? And also... Why don't you answer that guy's question on how much money we're losing? Yeah, <laughs> and, and so, you know, that's the power of showing up sometimes. You know, the, the media, Reuters ran headlines, so we got thousands of articles out of it. So we got this groundswell of momentum going, and Bank of America reversed itself in a matter of three weeks. That's awesome. So that's, that's the power awesome. of showing up that the left knows that the right needs to really start learning about. Hi, this is Tom Gibbons, Range Master, and this is Meet the Pressers with Matt Mallory and Clint Macro. Meet the Pressers. You know, we, we, we try to empower our, our fellow Americans, folks that enjoy liberty and, and exercise their rights. We try to empower them with actionable advice on ways that they can further pursue liberty and uh, spread that gospel. If someone were wanting to get into activism that you do or want to make a difference in their local community with local businesses, what would you recommend that they do to start off with? What are some resources they can look oh, at? Yeah. Books? Yeah, yeah. It, there, there's some very simple action items, low-hanging fruit that, that everyone can engage in, right? It, the first one is the franchise. And I'm not talking about your political franchise in voting. I'm talking about your corporate ballots, right? About uh, 26 27% of all shares in publicly traded companies are owned by individual investors, they only vote at a 30% clip on their corporate ballots. So every publicly traded company, uh, you either get them through your snail mail or through your email. If you invest in any publicly traded company, you get a vote every single year on shareholder proposals 
and uh, for boards of directors and for management proposals. And let me tell you, the 30% that is voting is a galvanized group of leftist individuals. Mm -hmm. So many conservative investors just take those things and throw them in the trash because they have no idea the value that those hold. And that's why liberals are gaining more and more influence over corporate America and corporate decision making, because many conservative investors can't be bothered to look up that there's shareholder proposals demanding that companies support abortion. That's real. And you just ignore to vote on it. There's, you know, shareholder proposals that are anti Second Amendment and you just ignored it. You didn't vote on it. There's, you know, both, there's shareholder proposals attacking religious freedom and getting corporate America on board with that, on that bandwagon. And you ignored it. Mm. So if you, if you are an investor and you've been just clicking delete on your email or throwing away your, your proxy ballots, stop doing that. <laughs> Vote, engage. The left wins by engagement. They don't win by disengaging. So that's, that's, the, that's the first. And if you want a little more... Uh, education on the proxy ballot process, on the good proposals and the bad proposals. We have something at our what come to nationalcenter.org. We have the Investor Value Voter Guide 2020 that runs through example after example of just how, what the left is doing, the specific proposals at which companies that you should pay attention to um, that'll that'll really help you vote your values. You know, we we talk about voting your values when it comes to the political ballot box. Uh, but folks don't realize they, they can carry that through to the corporate ballot box as well. That's so profound. I mean, just to think about that. I mean, I, I mean, as you're saying that, I'm thinking to myself, I, I've done that. And, and because I'm thinking to myself, I'm, you know, the company's making me money. You know, what do I care about voting? Whoever's in that lead spot is doing a good job making me money. So what do I care about anything else? But when you start thinking about the deeper line of that and they're, and they're, they're, um, you know, political act uh, political mindset comes into those yeah that makes me uh, cringe to think what I threw out right and so you know switching switching topics to focus on you know a specific example of religious freedom uh, we, we can just see how the left operates so just 2016 the legislature in Georgia passes a state level religious freedom law which, by the way, 31 other states already have such laws on the books at that time. The federal government passed the, you know, federal religious freedom restoration law in 1993. Remember who was president then? Uh, Bill Clinton. It was co-authored co by none other than the Lion of the Senate, Ted Kennedy. Okay, it's not very controversial. But by 2016, the LGBTQ activists had made religious freedom uh, into a controversial issue. So the legislature there passes uh, a religious freedom law pretty much overwhelmingly. Well, what happened next? Disney threatened to pull out all of its filming studios in Georgia. AMC Networks, which films The Walking Dead in Georgia, threatened to pull out The Walking Dead and all other filming in Georgia. And over 500 companies, including Georgia-based Coca-Cola and Home Depot, signed on to this campaign as well to go after <laughs> Nathan Deal, the governor at the time, um, his knees were weak, and he vetoed the bill. Okay, and again, this was a years-long campaign, though, that the left was building up through their, through their shareholder activism, through their outside activist organizations. And where were we? You know, where were, where were we to stop that? So fast forward in 2019, same thing. Georgia passes pro-life legislation. The left goes nuts. The, that law is currently being, you know, litigated. So we'll see where it ends up. But the same companies are threatening the same action because why? They had success last time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gave yeah, motivation. It's absolutely right. So I know when we spoke on the phone and uh, we had that uh, that long call months ago, you had mentioned something about there's a certain amount of stock that you own that gives you the ability to get in there and that's going to change or some laws or something that's going to change with that. Can you talk about that? And, um, you know, would it be better for somebody to spend the money on doing it that way? Or would it be a better use of uh, resources and money to, to invest into like your organization or, or, or both needed required? I mean, what's the, the game plan with this to be able to, to give best bang for our buck, I guess we'd say. Yeah, believe it or not, currently the threshold to file a shareholder resolution is $2,000. Mm -hmm. 
That's it. It's not a high bar. You don't need to be a millionaire investor to engage. Uh, the numbers may increase. The SEC has a proposed rule that is just kind of hanging in limbo right now. So I don't know what the future looks like, uh, but it's not going to increase a lot. It's just going to increase a little bit um, if that rule goes into effect. But right now, if you want to engage by filing a shareholder resolution with a publicly traded company, you just need to own $2,000 of stock for a year. year. You, need right. to, you need to hold it continuously for a year and then you can file. But to show up to a shareholder meeting, just to go and to question a CEO, like I talked about when I questioned Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan, you need to own one share. Hmm. That's it. That's it. And let's talk about a little bit more about the power of showing up when we're talking you know, about issues of faith. You guys may recall an incident a couple of years ago where on her television show, The View, loudmouth Joy Behar called our vice president, Mike Pence, mentally ill. Mm. Now, why did she say he was mentally ill? Because he talks to God. And that's crazy. Well, of course, we all talk to our Lord in prayer, don't we? Amen. Yes, sir. And so she refused to apologize for this. A month later, the Disney shareholder meeting, Disney is the parent company of ABC, where The View is on, came up. And so I went to the shareholder meeting and... The CEO's name's Bob Iger. He's considered the most powerful man in Hollywood. Said, so, Mr. Iger, why is it okay for one of your highest paid ABC celebrities to bash Christianity and offend Christians worldwide? He goes, Justin, I want to stop you right there. He said, I was offended by what Joy said too. And you should know we had her call Vice President Pence and apologize. Wow. So, That's great. But her sin was public. She didn't mm -hmm. just offend Vice President Pence. She offended all Christians. Yeah. So her apology needs to be public too. Later that day, Fox News got, got Vice President Pence to confirm that story. He said, yeah, but I actually, when Joy called me, I told her she should apologize publicly too, and she refused. Wow. Four days later, after the shareholder meeting, Joy Behar apologized on The View to every Christian that she defended. That's the power of showing up. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. And you would need one share of Disney to do that. That's all. <laughs> and you could go do the same thing. That is we've, awesome. We've, we've been conditioned over the years that, that our rights and liberties don't mean anything and that, yeah. that our, our, our vote doesn't count. And if you plead the fifth, you're guilty. And the guy that exercises the Second Amendment right is a, is a vigilante. But, but we do know, and, and this is a great example of one person can make a difference and can make that needle move towards the side of liberty. I, that's a great story. I, I very, appreciate it. Very much so. And look, it's a lot of fun, right? Because <laughs> <Like, laughs> you're <laughs> yeah. giving you know, it to them. Well, you know, I, I, I've confronted Jeff Bezos of Amazon. I've confronted Tim Cook of Apple. And, you know, I, I don't have millions in investments, folks. I have a small investment. And if you... And if you want to get engaged, you know, track me down, you know, nationalcenter.org, shoot me an email, give me a call. I'm happy to, you know, teach folks how to do this, to, to get engaged on whatever issue, if it's religious freedom, if it's life, if it's the Second Amendment. There, Believe me, if you believe in any traditional liberty, there's a slew of companies out there that are offending it on a daily basis mm. and working to not only offending it, but working, working to, you know, limit or eliminate altogether that mm. right. Um, and so, the, yeah, it, the, the answer is we're, we're also a 501c3, so, you know, any donation is tax deductible to our organization awesome. uh, that, that can increase our portfolio because the number of bad corporate actors grows by the day. So I need to buy more stock in the, in, in the bad corporations. And the other piece of advice I would have for folks that if they want to get involved in this is there's a conservative inclination to boycott or mm -hmm. divest. Mm -hmm. The history of the conservative boycott is nothing but an epic failure, right? Um, when Nike, for example, pulled, pulled a Betsy Ross tribute shoe because Colin Kaepernick, you know, cop hating Colin Kaepernick demanded it. Um, should that have surprised anybody? Mm -hmm. No, because when, for example, Nike was involved in the bathroom bill in North Carolina, and taking the liberal side in that issue, conservatives threatened to boycott. When Nike signed Colin Kaepernick to his seven to eight figure deal, whatever it is in the first place, conservatives threatened to boycott. 
Well, Nike stock went up each time. Their, you know, their revenues grew each time. So they're quite sure they can offend conservative values with impunity because we keep threatening boycotts and never doing it. Yeah. Um, because conservatives, look, at the end of the day, you know, activism isn't necessarily our best thing. And we just, we, we go back to our families. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't keep, keep it up. So we just want to be left alone and work hard. Yeah. And I will tell you, I will tell you as well, the left doesn't win by disengaging. The left is winning over corporate America because they engage more. When they see a company doing something they don't like, they all get involved. They don't back off. They engage. They so, yeah, the, the, the conservative inclination towards disengagement um, is, is the wrong approach. If it were the right approach, we'd be winning a lot more, wouldn't we? My name is Kim Stolfer. I'm president of Firearms Owners Against Crime. The right to bear arms is a civil right not meant for negotiation, as some politicians would have you believe. So if you believe in the Second Amendment, you believe in individual liberties, please get involved now. Make sure your friends are registered to vote. Because on November 4th, if we don't do what we need to do, we're all going to pay the price. Yeah, when we first started with the whole Free Enterprise Project, and you know, we saw all these liberal shareholder resolutions, and we decided to do it, we had no idea the power these things had. We literally, we had no clue. Um, but let me tell you, about five years ago now, can't say the company, but I filed a resolution with one of the largest food and beverage companies in America. I'm sitting in my tiny condo in Arlington, Virginia, 45 minutes after I submitted my, my cell phone rates. And it's the general counsel and the head of investor relations from that company. They had gotten in a room together 45 minutes after I filed the resolution, wow. which, by the way, was calling the company out for hypocrisy um, on, on the issue of religious freedom. And they had one question. I said, Justin, what can we do to get this shareholder proposal off the proxy statement this year? That's the power of proposals. Companies generally hate these things so much mm. that they're willing to negotiate with the filer for a policy change or, you know, a, you know some sort of, um, you know, amendment to a corporate document or what have you. So I often say filing a shareholder resolution is the opening salvo of a negotiation. A couple of years ago, when I filed a resolution with Amazon, I had a meeting with eight very high level executives that went on for over an hour. By the end, it was clear that we weren't going to come to a successful negotiation that, you know, they weren't going to move on the policy position I was looking for. So what did they do? They offered me a private meeting with Jeff Bezos if I would withdraw the resolution. <laughs> At that point, the richest man in the world. <laughs> That's how much these companies are willing to negotiate. Wow. And so, uh, by the way, I said no because I thought my proposal was more important than a meeting with uh, Mr. Yeah, Bezos. Yeah. <laughs> that, would, that would say nothing. But it goes to show you, you know, the power, the power that these resolutions have. And in 2018, the last year, the full numbers are out for. 48% of shareholder resolutions that were filed were withdrawn, hmm. meaning there was a policy negotiation of some kind. A but again, the left files 95 to 98% of these things every year. Hmm. So they had hundreds of victories that year. 48%, by the way, the highest ever for hmm. filing and then withdrawing. So they're having hundreds of victories that we don't even know about. Right. So, that's, so, so a lot of people got to meet with Jeff, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if that resolution gets posted, for lack of a better term, or put on the trestle board, then everybody gets to read it and see it because they're going to consider it. whether they vote or not. So it's kind of one of those things there, even if they get the poison out there, even if it doesn't pass, but that plants a seed in the brain of all, yep. the, all the investors. So yeah, I could see where that would be very, very powerful because if oh, you're yeah. calling them out, the other people who are pretty much blind to what's going on, you know, unfortunately, most human beings are kind of oblivious as to what's going on around them. Yep. That brings that out. And that's, that's why they'd rather give you an opportunity to have a mint julep with Bezos than, <laughs> than have everyone read your proposal, right? That, that's right. And so, you know, the left uses these to gain, to gain further footholds and to change corporate policy. Um, you know, again, like we talked about, you don't need to change the law to change the culture. Right. But I'll tell you what, in the last, you know, 18 months, or so there's been a there's been a big awakening because it, it hardly a day goes by that a corporation doesn't offend a traditional value uh, in a new way even mm -hmm. right I, I think a lot of folks have seen I think Nike 
really woke a lot of people up, right? When they signed Colin Kaepernick, you know, despite his, you know, past and his hatred for the police and his hatred for this country, calling the 4th of July this year, Independence Day, a white supremacist holiday. And then ESPN announces like some seven part series that he's going to, he's going to educate our youth about, you know, race in American history. I, I think folks are starting, you know, they're starting to see at least all the bad actions. They don't really know what to do about it, mm-hmm. but yeah, we, we saw this, we saw this a while back. When I talk about the, the takeover of corporate America, my concern is that in 10 years, it'll be the college campus, right? Where conservatives are marginalized on every level. And the way well, I think that's it, already, that's already happening. Yeah, it's to it's a large degree. Funny. The cancel culture is real, um, but how they took over academia, they're doing it the same way. It's it's tripart. What we've been talking about right now has exclusively been the outside in agitation, right? Well, it's also top down and bottom up. If you look at the boards of directors of the Fortune one through one hundred, they lean dramatically to the left. It's something like a seventy thirty Democrat Republican split amongst folks with prior political activity right now. So that's, that's intentional. You know, that, that is the search firms have gotten woke. So they're bringing these, you know, board, potential board members that are, that are far to the left. So that's an intentional. But there's also a bottom-up takeover. And this is the same thing you see on college campuses where the woke protesters feel the most emboldened. And if you're a conservative student like I was in law school, you know, you mostly you stay, you stay quiet, right? You don't, you're beholden to your teachers for your grades and they know they hate the worldview. Uh, what are you going to do? Risk a bad grade or just shut up? And most people choose to self silence, right? Yeah. We're seeing right. the same thing in corporate America now. When I engage with C suite folks at lots of these big companies, I'll ask them why you do any number of liberal things. Why do you fund Planned Parenthood? Why do you fund the human rights campaign? What, you know, whatever the issue is, why do you hate the Second Amendment? They all say it's what our employees want us to do. Employees, yeah. Because the woke, but my response to them, by the way, every single time is, have you ever done a silent poll of your employee base? Because you're not speaking for all of them. But the woke right. employees feel emboldened to go to the HR, go to their managers, right. and demand that they take up their causes. Silent majority. Conservative employees don't. But mm-hmm. guess what? Like, if you're an employee right now, do you think every Gatorade employee is happy that the company donated to the Marxist Black Lives Matter organization? I'm guessing not. Right. But did any of the conservative employees who are offended by that say anything? Probably not. Too busy working. No, you're not going to get canceled for saying, hey, why did we donate to a Marxist group? Okay, you may marginalize some of your most woke employees, but guess what? They probably hate you anyway. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let the managers hear from both sides. Yeah. Conservative employees, speak your truth. We need to speak up now before, it's too late. otherwise someone else is gonna speak for us, right? Yep, that's true. Yeah, yeah. And it's I, probably not gonna be someone that thinks the same way we do. <laughs> let's, let's say it certainly won't be so. Yes. <laughs> Justin, you've, you've uh, said it a number of times, the website, but if you could give specific information, what would be the best way people could reach out to you if they have questions or, or want to uh, learn more about it or even help the cause? Yeah, sure. So uh, come to nationalcenter.org. Um, you can reach out to me directly on Twitter at Dan Hoff Justin. Awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. been great Ooh. having you. Very enlightening. Ooh. Be the first kid on your block to have your official issue Meet the Pressers logoed gear. Visit the Meet the Pressers merchandise page on BallisticInc.com to get your high-quality, American-made Meet the Pressers shirts and hats. There's a lot of sponsors to make this show possible, like Mantis. Make sure you check them out and give them your business. This episode is brought to you by Mountain Man Medical. The right medical training and gear should be accessible to every American. Mantis. Mantis X helps shooters suck less. Meet the Pressers is sponsored by Next Level Training, Saber Red, Cutting Edge Bullets, the USCCA, ASP, Common Sense Self-Defense, and T1 Ammunition. Meet the Pressers is also generously supported by other fine companies, ranges, and our Patreon members. Thank you. Thanks for watching the show. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, share, click the little bell, come on Patreon, help support us that way, come to one of our classes, or host us, we can come to you and do one of our courses at your location. So until next time, 
Adieu. Thank you for watching Meet the Pressers. 